Welcome to our webinar, Executive Function Skills, Your Team Needs Before Graduating from High School with Mary Murphy. This webinar is presented by SpedNet Wilton in partnership with Wilton Youth Council, Wilton Public Schools, Wilton Library, and Newtown SPED PTA. And we're grateful for our part partnership. I will turn the mic over briefly to Andrea from the Wilton Library. Nice to meet you. Yeah, welcome. Welcome to everyone. This is such a well attended webinar. I'm so excited because I know this is a really important and relevant topic. And uh, I work on uh, Wilton Library programs. And I just want to say how happy and pleased and um, about we are about our ongoing partnership with SpedNet and all of the other co sponsors. Um, we think that these are super important topics for you as adults of teens, especially to today going to um, college, perhaps from graduating from high school. So anyway, with that, I just want to say thank you and enjoy the webinar because I think it'll be great. Thanks to Mary and turn it over to Janine. Thank you, Andrea, and thank you again for your partnership and for working with us. Um, so hi again, everyone. This is really big. This is a really huge topic, very important. Um, executive function skills are necessary for success, for success in school and in life. And having trouble with executive function skills is common for most typical learners and for those who think and learn differently for adults and for children. Um, every individual with ADHD has executive function difficulties and most individuals with other learning challenges may also struggle with executive function. We have Dr. Mary Murphy here, we're so excited. She's a licensed clinical psychologist and she will discuss the executive function skills your teens need to learn before graduating from high school and how you can assist them in developing and implementing helpful strategies. Dr. Murphy specializes in counseling, executive function and academic coaching, psychological testing, psychotherapy and biofeedback. Her counseling practice focuses on helping children and adolescents affected by mood disorders, neurological conditions, and substance abuse. Just a few housekeeping items. Um, please check out our website for additional topics of interest. All of our prior webinars have been recorded and posted there for you to view at your leisure. Also available on our website are acclaimed guide to special services, bringing knowledge to the table, how to be an effective advocate for your child. This guide walks you through the special services process in a very clear, and user-friendly way. Uh, we can pro provide you with a soft copy upon request. If you have students in the Wilton Public Schools, you can receive a free copy from the district and you can also order it through our website um, through Amazon. Also, if you find our support helpful, please feel free to donate to SpedNet Wilton. You can do so directly on our website. We're a nonprofit organization and 100% of your donations go directly back to our programs. Our SpedNet Wilton board is here today to answer any questions after the presentation. Eve Kessler, executive director and co-founder of SpedNet Wilton. Um, and I am Janine Kelly. Just a few quick ground rules before we get started. We're gonna leave time for questions after the presentation. Please type your questions into the Q&A and not into the chat. It's just easier to keep track of which questions have been answered that way. Also, please be mindful that this is an open forum and the presentation is being recorded. So you don't want to ask any questions that would reveal confidential information that you might not want out there in the public sector. Also, any information provided in this presentation by Dr. Murphy or our SpedNet Wilton board members is not intended to be legal or therapeutic advice. The information, content, and materials are for general purposes only. And with that being said, Welcome, Dr. Murphy. We're so excited to have you. I'm turning the mic over to you. Thank you, Janine. And Eve and Andrea, I really appreciate it. Um, I always start by saying that I feel like SpedNet is my second home, so I'm always so happy. And I haven't done one in a while, so I'm happy to be back. I feel like I've been on hiatus. So um, this is really great. And, and this, um, I feel like apologizing in advance, is such a huge topic that um, I've tried to pace it so that there's a good amount of time for questions at the end, um, but it is, again, a very large topic. So I'm hoping that this, um, the timing is okay for us all. Um, okay, so what I wanted to do was to start by talking about um, kind of why I talk about this topic, why it's so important um, and so prevalent in my life. 
there's one thing, um, I have two aspects of my life that um, brings me into contact with this topic intimately every day. Um, my background is that I'm a college professor at WestCon. And so for many, many years, I've been seeing really which students come in best prepared for a success in college and then who struggles the most. And so I, I do see a very clear set of skills that are lagging in a certain group of um, subset of students and like, all skills are, they are teachable skills. And so <clears throat> I think that that's really important to emphasize that these are lagging skills with some students and others seem you know, to be kind of like ready to go um, once they get to college. And so I'm used to seeing what those um, holes and gaps are. And so that's why I emphasize the things that I will today so we could get working on them. And the second thing is that um, uh, I guess, on the other side of things, uh, clinically, I work with students all the time who often my typical profile is someone who has um, two different profiles. One is that they've dropped out of college because they really had a lot of executive functioning difficulties in the beginning, and they need to return home for a little while, just get extra supports before they return to school. And again, focus on those executive functioning skills and especially coping skills um, so that they can get back to school. So those are therapy um, clients that I have. And then I also, as a preventative measure, um, have run college boot camps where we have rising seniors and, and students about to graduate from high school, where they do a three-day course on the skills that they need to be successful, many of which are the ones I'm going to talk about today. So, um, so sometimes I'm working with people on prevention side. And sometimes I'm the teacher on the other end, seeing where there were holes in someone's background that led them to have difficulty. And sometimes I'm, I'm really having to work with somebody therapeutically because they've really ex experienced such a difficult time that they need therapy and support before going back to college. So I come at this uh, from a lot of different angles. And, and so that's why I'm kind of speaking about it probably in a different way um, than people are used to hearing about it today. So. The things that we already have ever known about executive functioning is, you know, what we all have ever heard about it. I'm going to elaborate on this a little bit later. But what we know executive function is, is that they're basically just a collection of skills um, that we all use to manage ourselves in order to achieve goals. You know, getting ourselves to something on time, getting here today to the webinar, right? Like managing all the things that needed to fall into place to get that to happen. Um, that's all executive functioning. And I also, as a joke, because um, people remember this better, I say executive functioning is adulting. <laughs> it's really about adulting. It's learning to do all the functions that we do as adults that we forget we had to learn over time. So when we say that somebody has executive function issues, it's actually not a clinical disorder. There are a lot of disorders that have executive function core deficits, uh, number one of which is ADHD. But executive function issues are highly prevalent in adolescence, and they are weaknesses in the kinds of skills that we need that are all of the different things that we need to do, like controlling our impulses and, and, and really just um, like having flexible thinking, getting started and being able to plan and organize and complete tasks and manage our emotions. That that really does sound like everything we do as adults. So that's why I call it adulting. Um, these are the skills that are absolutely supposed to be under development and can look messy during adolescence. And it could look like they have a lot of different problems because of. And these are skills that we need to focus on and, and have them master so that they can be successful in life, their careers, learning, relationships, everything is affected by getting these core foundation skills in place. So when you ever look them up online, they talk about there being like either six or eight categories of executive functions. These are the classic definitions. And so this is for your reference. And what I'm gonna kind of jump to is explaining that it's a little bit redefined when we're thinking about the, the period of time that people are in high school and getting ready to need the skills in place they become more like life skills um, and easier to conceptualize, I think, if we say that we're working on not just building their executive function, but we're, we're working on what their life skill 
functional capacity needs to be to be able to go to college. So traditionally, when they say self-control, I'm going to talk about just how do they manage themselves, their communication, their assertiveness skills. Um, emotional control that we say um, is it executive function category really comes down to coping skills, how well they can cope with um, and problem solve them, them, themselves with themselves through different problems once they're um, having to manage them themselves. And task initiation, they say, um, I talk about that as just academic practical skills. I'll, I'll describe what all of these are. And then working memory is being able to use the tools um, to track and plan things and not just keep everything in your head um, the way maybe students would say, I'm just gonna not write down my homework, I'm gonna keep it in my head. Um, we have working memory issues because of um, students trying to do things like that a lot. Um, and then um, being able to self-monitor is, is the skills we'll talk about are really developing their ability to think critically about things and have a self-awareness of what they're having trouble with, identifying what problems they might have and need to work on. And then flexibility is like problem solving. How do you adjust when life throws problems your way and, and things have to you know, slide and, and adjust and change all the time? Um, and then we know, and I emphasize a lot, um, the kinds of categories I'll emphasize the most today is actually the planning and the time management categories. Time management is still called time management and in my slides, um, but planning an organization is more about establishing reminder systems and routines for people. And um, so just conceptually, I wanted us to know that as we're talking about this, it's really easiest to think of this as a set of life skills that we'll be working on with our kids before they go to college. All right. And I wanna start by just explaining that this is all normal. The problems that the students have at this age are normal. Our kids are having problems that are expected. The backdrop for having executive function issues, and I would argue childhood is an executive function disorder, essentially. Being an adolescent, that's why we have executive function issues. That's why we're seeing this with our kids. It is an incredibly challenging time. It is the largest period of time they will ever have all of the changes that they are having from head to toe. We never have to go through this again, but they are in constant flux. They are changing physically in their body, emotionally, their thinking which abilities, which is really like their, their cognitive abilities. Their brain is maturing. They're developing their sense of right and wrong, like their moral development. Every aspect of their life is significantly changing. So when they're in flux like this, of course, things are feeling unstable for them and it's hard for them to achieve the tasks that they need to, which is that they have to figure out how to be autonomous, how to function independently and do things for themselves. They also have to figure out who they are. Like, you know, we forget that this period of time happened and, but if we could remember how difficult this was, it was incredibly difficult. They're forming a sense of who they are and all of that is, is forming their self-concept, like how they see themselves and how they see their worth. So a lot of the foundation for good mental health and academic skills are being built right now. And this is why it's so hard. The picture is um, scaffolding around the brain on purpose because we say that basically the brain is under construction during this time. And what's happening is essentially the only part of their brain that is super perfectly functioning is evolutionarily, like the only reason um, that they are struggling so much is because the part of their brain that they have to rely on, because the rest of it is not actually in place yet, is, is the center of emotion, which is the amygdala. So they're trying to make decisions with a lot of their automatic um, solutions and automatic drives, bringing them towards emotional solutions and not being able to see things as rationally as we can when we're adults. Because the amygdala is all about emotions and impulses and just like instinctive behavior. It's not the frontal lobes, right? Where we actually have our executive functioning is the front of our brain, which develops last, unfortunately, not even until like age 25. So we don't have enough 
of those materials in place that they don't have those materials in place yet to be able to do all the adulting that we would hope that they can do. One of the, um, the best ways to think about who has executive function issues is the model of a student with ADHD. So I refer to them a lot. And so when we think about an, a kid with ADHD, one of the most famous people in this area is um, Dr. Russell Barkley. And he explains um, in, in really like succinct ways um, what struggles they have. And basically what he explains is that the brain for a child with significant executive function issues like those with ADHD are functioning 30% less in their executive functioning. So if they are 15, they are you know, really more um, functioning like a 10 year old's level of executive functioning skills. So there's like a 30% reduction in um, their chronological age versus what we can expect of them automatically without extra prompting and training and supports. It doesn't mean that that's the end of the story. It just means our baseline for what we can expect them to be able to do independently is that much lower. And so there's a range of what you may see with your children of how difficult their executive function problems are, how significant they are, but somewhere on the order of around 30%, if you're seeing them having a lot of executive function issues that we'll talk about today, then we have to expect that they need a lot more supports to get them up to the level of what their chronological age is. And this impacts their ability to go to college on time and be successful. So without you know, having a lot of supports shored up for them, it is very difficult um, to be able to meet the demands of going to college. So we'll talk about some of the supports we can give them. And I put this picture of um, a kid gaming on purpose because I wanted to emphasize that, um, and probably point out the frustration you guys have, that uh, the reason that kids during this age are so wired for, um, using or playing video games is because they are wired for that. That amygdala, it, it speaks to that. It's the instant reward. It's the satisfaction. They are wired for emotion and reward and not putting things off to go study and, you know, get themselves ready for college. It, it's, it, that's not where their brain is at. And so video games is a good um, model for understanding, um, these kinds of difficulties. What, um, what we also explain, um, oh, the other second most uh, equally famous person um, in this field is Dr. Hollowell. And, you know, literally written the book on ADHD. And he describes that adolescence is like you have a Ferrari engine for a brain, but bicycle brakes. So their brain is moving really, really fast and instinctual and, and full of energy, but they don't have the executive functioning skills of a Ferrari. They have more like a bicycle functioning level for their executive functioning. So, so their brain and their development is very uneven. And the things that we might be able to expect from them are uneven. And that's why we have to kind of um, fill in the gaps for them. And this is adolescence in a nutshell and what our kids are struggling with, with executive functioning is like this famous um, quote, instant gratification even takes too long. <laughs> you know, they, they need things to happen now and, you know, putting off things to like, make sure it looks good on a college application is certainly not their first instinct. It is all about instant reward and in the moment, what can they do? And so this is the backdrop for understanding why they're having the difficulties that they are. This is why it's normal that they're having the difficulties that they are. So what can we do? Our role as parents. This is the number one mantra that I have. And so um, it is not what, we, what you do for your children, but what you have taught them to do for themselves that will make them successful human beings. There is no meme or quote on the internet. So I do think that I might've invented <laughs> another one. I capture this by saying, helping is not always helpful. So we spend a lot of time as parents doing for our kids. 
And we don't recognize this quote, which is the, the crux of it is how much did we teach them so that they could be able to do them, those tasks for themselves? Or did we jump in there and do it for them? When we think we're helping, it is the most well-intentioned, loving thing we do as parents, except I want to try to turn our thinking about this a little bit upside down and think about how much help we might be providing could actually be hurting them. And so I know that's a hard thing to hear and parents that I work with never wanna hear me say that and it never goes well. But I have to explain that what we're doing for them is very often something that ends up taking away their ability to rise up and be able to do these things themselves. So these adulting skills are things we need to help them be able to do. We need to figure out how in any practical way we can help them with what lies ahead. They might take a gap year. They might go straight to college. They might go straight to the workforce. Whatever it is, they need these same skills. So before going to college or any alternate is, is or except I would say gap year is about completely immersing yourself in learning these executive function skills. That's what be, would be one of the good purposes of a gap year. So our role as parents is what I wanna emphasize. Our role is changing during this stage of life. When kids are in high school, we have to remember their stage of development, that they need to develop a sense of autonomy, being able to do things themselves and feel competent and be competent to do it and develop an independence that they can do these things. One of the most practical thing I tell all parents is that it's very important to narrate every single thing that we do during this age. We should be saying out loud, which is not necessary for us to hear, but we should be saying out loud why we're doing everything that we're doing when we're trying to be helpful. If you narrate a problem um, I mean, talk it out loud purposely, not just with your own internal thoughts, but say out loud in front of your children. This just broke down. I think I'm going to consider calling this guy to fix it, or maybe I can first look on Amazon, look for this part, look at the label on here and look up this model number and see maybe I could maybe get this and maybe there's a way I could fix this myself. I talk through the whole problem solving event that is happening in front of you, or even just simply cooking dinner. You know, I'm going to put this on the stove and let it simmer for this amount of time because it'll, it'll get sticky if I don't do it this way. I'm going to load the dishwasher this way or else the water doesn't come all the way through and then nothing gets clean above it. These are such practical, obvious things that we do without actually like remembering when we learned them, but they don't know any of this. They don't know any of the practical skills. And so when we take any extra opportunity to narrate why we're doing something, it is is so useful and it might not at all seem intuitive or necessary, but it is critical for parents to be doing this in all aspects of their life. And this is what I mentioned, helpful, helping is not always helpful. It actually engenders dependence. And this is the part that parents need to hear me say. Um, but it's actually called overly um, accommodating somebody. Overly accommodating someone and doing for them, like I said, does create and breed dependence. So in an age appropriate way, and you know your child, you know, you, you would not have them paint the house if they have, uh, they can't make toast yet. You know, like, you know, what kinds of skills that they could be working on. But if we don't take a step back and, and think of not just jumping in and doing for them, we're going to be kind of shortchanging them always. Okay. So we have to be careful that and make sure that our role now is shifting to showing rather than doing. That should be a mantra for parenting during high school. We have to model the life skills because executive functioning is much more about practical daily life skills now. What can they do to function and be able to do this independently in the future? So I use this picture as a model to remember something very important. 
during high school, I would say even before, even middle school, we are used to writing emails for our kids. We talk to the teachers, we intercede all the time. In this picture, you see that the mom is there guiding, but the kid is the one who is in front of the computer, has some of um, the autonomy to be you know, given a task, and is the one who has their hands on the computer. This is a model for what I'd want you to keep in mind. When we want them to do something, they need to have hands on. So hands on the dishwasher, hands on the cooking, hands on the computer. When you're talking through with them, what skills you want them to be working on. For example, being able to write an email to a teacher and say, I'm not really clear about the assignment instructions and you not be the person to write to the teacher and getting them to check their Google Classroom daily or PowerSchool, usually Google Classroom, um, but depending on your school system, whatever that model is, having them check their daily assignments, that's what you would side-by-side -side sit with them and be their scaffolding until they're independently doing it. One of the things that I think about is like a five-foot rule. If you have to be duct taped, to them, for them to do something, then they can't do it independently. But then you can start to let the, the string go a little bit more and they can go five feet away and sit at the dining room table and do those emails to their teacher. First, you have to be next to them. Then they can go and be at the kitchen table, make sure they're not wandering off in their mind about what they were supposed to go to the task to do. And then, you know, they can be five feet away from you and you know that they can still carry out the task. But that transition has to happen. If we do it all entirely, they get no chance. We don't get anywhere near the five foot. Um, being side by side and having them do hands-on and talking through, not saying what to write in the email, but what do you think would be good to say? Asking them questions. What do you think would be good to say about what we just talked about that's confusing to you about your assignment? And then they get a chance to generate the thought about their own problem solving and write the email themselves. That's a practical way um, to demonstrate that they could be doing those kinds of things for themselves. So keep in mind hands-on, that's why that visual is there. There's two main uh, things, um, skills uh, that are practical, um, academic skills that they can be working on, and then self-management of, of themselves internally. So one of the things they have to learn um, are concrete strategies on how to study. Take, there's proven science um, that has studied this for years, and we know that there are three things that I would never leave um, I, I would not let a high schooler go to college without knowing these three things. <laughs> the, the Pomodoro technique is a way of kind of setting up their time to get them started with working on a task and using timers to kind of help them with uh, getting through being aware how much time is passing and taking breaks appropriately. It breaks down an hour for them so that they can, um, it's, it's, they work in 25 minute incre increments. It's, it's sort of like um, interval training, you know, at the gym. So it's interval training for academics. And so they get to not have to sit there and think, oh my God, this is endless. This is going to go on for hours, but it's going to be, okay, they're going to work on this for 20 minutes or 25 minutes, and then they get a five minute break. And then they're going to have a longer break at a certain point during the hour. There is a resource slide that explains exactly how you set the timer. Um, it's a website, even tomatotimer.com that uh, they basically you know, can put on their desktop and they end up being able to like set timers and know that it's not endless and that there's bounds to getting something done and, and, and being more aware of time because I'll talk about why time is an issue for them later. And then Cornell note-taking um, techniques is a way to set themselves up for studying and to not try this impossible task of writing down absolutely everything a teacher says that Cornell te note-taking technique is tried and true. It is um, you know, easy to find on the internet. It's, it's a way of planning out a piece of paper and bulleting out 
main points and not writing out full sentences that distract a student from being able to take good notes. And then at the bottom, having a summary of just what is the main point of what that teacher just said in this, this class today. And then you only have to study that you know, summary page. And it's a, it's a way of teaching them how to be concise and how to listen for important nuggets of information and, and, and not just feel I'm a, that they're a human recorder of writing down everything they hear. So it gives them an organization and a structure. Otherwise, no taking is a mess. And then studying is a mess as a consequence. So, um, and then the last thing is primacy and recency. So we know from de um, more than 200 years of research about memory that they learn best what they first heard and what they last heard. So when we teach them how to study in chunks, it's because there's more beginnings and ends. So we know that we want them to learn to study in small intervals where there's small, whether it's a small list of vocabulary or a small list of um, <clears throat> the foreign language, um, you know, words they're supposed to memorize. Um, or, or a list of topics from um, their science lecture, whatever it might be. As long as they're doing it in small little lists, of, there's a lot of beginnings and ends with each of their times that they study. That avoids um, missing so many things that are in the middle that they just don't remember, um, which cramming can do, because you can study for hours, but you really miss all the stuff you were studying in the middle. And the other thing is kind of, learning about yourself. What we want them to start to learn is what is the sweet spot for them between being challenged enough and, but not being lost or overwhelmed. So they can't be, you've probably seen this with the courses that they have for electives. They might pick something or even be put in a level of class that is so under challenging that they end up not doing well and they could fail an easy class. That's because the challenge level has to be right at the right level for them. And it can't be too hard that they end up getting lost. So during this age, they're learning how to be able to figure out, is this too much for me? Is this something that I am bored to death? Is it that I'm bored because there is not enough here that I, I I, I feel like I need to look, like I'm not learning because like, it might be under challenged. So it's not, the, the point is that many students that I see, I'm surprised by the fact that they know something inside and out, even though they were failing it. So it, it often is like a, a mismatch with challenge level. Um, and then what we learned during COVID uh, remote learning is all about our environment and um, the desk and the placement in the house where we are most conducive to studying. Those are things that they have to keep doing and maybe keep working out if they didn't work it out during remote learning to optimize their environment so that they can duplicate that when they go to college. A lot of trial and error happens during high school to find the right environment and the right background, um, whether they need perfect quiet, whether they need some kind of um, music playing in the background. These are all things that we, we don't know until they do trial and error. And then um, they have to work on these skills of learning how to complete their assignments. So they have to get away from the uh, strategy of finishing all their work during class and not having any work at home. So that doesn't work long-term for life for college, for careers. It is a very weird artificial generational thing that's happened where high school kids, uh, all kids, even middle schoolers are set up that they're doing it during study halls and, and just quickly running through what their homework is rather than doing anything. The goal of any teenager is to never do homework at home. <laughs> and so getting away from that um, because it's not practical for college success, the most you can um, emphasize, the more you can emphasize that it's best to do this at, um, at home and setting up a strategy to do it at home is going to help them long-term. So figuring out how they learn best is also about the environment I mentioned, but figuring out like 
do they visually need to have their their papers with lots of colors i have a student that you know swears by having all these colors and pens and markers and stuff and visually she needs that to be engaging with the material because it's boring to her um, some people have to listen to their textbooks and those are accommodations that we need to ask for and those are strategies that they'll continue to use throughout life and if they are you know, not able to engage with the material because it's it's not in the format that makes sense for them and they can't retain it or they won't even engage in it and they just refuse to do the work. It's usually because there's a mismatch with the, the mode of delivery. So if auditory, you know, listening to textbooks needs to be added, that there is plenty, I should have added this and I'll add it to the resource slide, um, Speechify has become a game changer for students. It is um, <clears throat> an app where people can um, uh, take a snapshot of, of a worksheet or um, a book, um, at pages, anywhere, and it translates it into speech. So if you don't have your textbook or your worksheets that you have to do um, in an auditory form, you can transform it now and it'll speak the text to you. So sometimes they need this multi-sensory approach where they're seeing it and listening to it, and then they're able to retain it better. So they have to practice and try out a lot of trial and error of different strategies and see what is their strength. As soon as they hear something, um, they might be you know, a terrible reader and, and not able to read the page, but they're great at listening. And you might not think your child is good at listening, but listening to material is different than listening to you. So don't forget that part. Um, Mary, I just want to, I'm sorry, I just want to do a time check. So yeah. it's, it's 11.39 and there are a lot of questions already. Oh, so okay. I just wanted to get, I just telling you the time. Okay, no problem. I'll skip on. Okay, so, so the two things that I mentioned we're going to talk about is planning and organizing. So I want you to emphasize right now using apps and planners, um, calendars, and that's really just a reminder to start working on that and immediately doing that. And the other part is time management, how to manage distractions. I'm gonna show you some of these um, slides because the important thing is that they're going to leave for college and no one will tell them when to eat or sleep or get up and go to class. Right now, what I'd like parents to do is to make them wake themselves up. Time routines to see how long it takes them to get something done, to get somewhere, finish common tasks, ad address the fact that they're kind of blind to time. They don't know how to balance um, school and their work and they don't know what to do now versus later. So I want you to look, take a deep dive at looking at some of these different apps. These are added as resources for you. All different productivity apps and um, these kind of like homework um, organization apps are critical. And using this, the actual things that are built into things like Google Classroom, like the to-do list. These are apps I want you to take a look at and to show to your kid. To block out distractions, these are the apps that do that. These are the ways that students are really on top of um, being able to block out for just portions of time. When they're on the computer, nothing else can be touched. Um, for example, when you use the state focused app. So it kind of locks them in. Productivity resources like using um, focusmate.com is really like a way to get somebody to sit down and do their work and they're expected to show up at that time because somebody shows up at the time that they log in to be able to do work with them. That is a much older student ready to go for college and during college to use that. But I mentioned this book that I want you to consider looking at because it has a lot of practical strategies that are talking about how to block out distractions. The big thing about self-management that I'll say is that they really mostly have to work on knowing when they don't know the answers for something and asking for help. So that becomes a critical skill of self-advocacy. This is just a famous, uh, a, a favorite part of a movie that I saw. This woman had to wear a sign around her neck that said, confront me if I don't ask for help. Like that's, that's absolutely what our role is as parents right now. 
So the practical things that we can do, like um, teaching them when they're sick, there are things they have to have. They have to have, I tell them, take a picture of your insurance card and keep it in your phone in a folder that says important stuff. You know, they have to be able to make appointments for themselves, put their prescriptions on auto refill once they're at college, knowing that that, you know, exists as an option. Those are things you need to do. And knowing themselves well about like, what is going to be best for them personally? Do they, do they need to pick a college that's number one in the country or do they need to know that it has the right accommodations for them? And then I'll talk about that in a minute. How to use coping skills is a huge reason why students drop out. So they rely on escapism, which you'll see right now that they're using games and phones and TikToks, not uh, being on TikTok, they're not recognizing that they have emotional triggers for things and then they run to escape and that they might need other coping skills to work on. So they'll have tons of peer pressure. And so we need to make sure that they're working on developing, their, knowing what their coping style is and coping skills that I'll show resources at the end um, that you can just peruse. Um, they are working on trying to control their impulses and become more flexible. And those are all things that we can model for them. So a big part of college is being able to be assertive. And so managing yourself is also socially and with professors being able to navigate those relationships. In college and even right now, being right is not always what's most important, but teaching them how to be gracious and deferential when necessary to certain adults um, being able to kind of um, teach them about the importance of having network and connections with your teachers and later with professors in college, teaching them about assertive communication so they get their needs met is, is a critical part. When they have to navigate all these social relationships at um, school, a lot of what happens is they have conflicts that they don't know how to resolve. Again, if we buffer those conflicts for them now during high school, they don't get a chance to problem solve and generate ideas for how can they navigate problems. So teaching them concrete things like how to speak um, to authority figures, um, whether it's, oh, I'm sorry, going back to adults. When they go to college, they often um, might have never really written emails to their teachers. They might not have had a lot of face-to-face -face contact. College is a lot of face-to-face -face contact with professors and lots of writing. And so in those assignments, you don't want them to be casual and speak about, I want this and I want that. Um, they need to be able to teach um, you know, or, or respond to the teacher saying um, feedback about you know, speaking too casually to them comes across as disrespectful. We don't want them to even like have that conversation ever. We want them to know um, how to actually um, write an email appropriately. And so the other practical skill I'll tell you is um, they need to be able to do things to function. Like I said, functional capacity in the world. They have to be able to read scripts, um, handwriting. Uh, the world's not going to print for them. Um, I've had interns come in my office, I write little sticky notes and put them on charts and they can't read my handwriting. They can't read the script. Um, they don't know how to leave voicemails for people. These are all things that if they, if there's ever an opportunity to write an email, to make an appointment for themselves, for their hair, for their dentist, like whatever it is, get, stand side by side with them and do it with them. It's first show them and then you're side by side having them hands on doing it. Those are the practical things that we want them to be able to function and do in the future. And related to this, these are life skills. How do you make appointments? How do you like get a medical appointment? Um, how do you make sure you make your next appointment at your current appointment so you don't ever forget that you had to call them back and get the next appointment? Kids with ADHD especially really have a hard time because their medicines are not automatically refilled. They have to be preauthorized every time. This falls through the gaps all the time, and then it leads to having um, difficulties like dropout. This is just some reminders um, that you could probably um, just look through. So teaching them the daily life skills that I mentioned, like doing laundry and a dishwasher and meal prep. These are all things they 
you need to be very explicit in showing them and um, using a credit card even. Um, I, I had this happen with my stepson recently. He was telling me that like he went to use a debit card for the first time and he put it in the machine and it started beeping at him and he was like, what's happening? Like he, he was kind of freaked out and didn't know. Um, so the practical matters of like, how do you do this? Literally putting hands on and, and how do you budget? Um, there's a, um, an app I forgot to write, I'll add called You Need a Budget. And I have high schooler um, clients that have used this, that have learned how to um, actually put aside money and save and like save for their car, their first car and stuff. Those are things um, like green light, especially is another one that teaches kill, uh, kids how to have the skill of saving and spending. And it's all authorized and controlled by the parent. So green light is a great one to look at um, for yourself to set your kids up with. And then, um, oh, this is what I already mentioned before about just using narration. I wanted to make sure that you just emphasize that problem solving when, them, when things don't go right is critical for them to do. And then this point I wanted to make is that it's very important to anticipate who's going to need more supports for their executive functioning. And um, we can expect, and we're, we know people who have diagnosis like ADHD, anxiety, depression, autism, and OCD. Those are the major players. They will have the most difficulty with college. And there are things that we can do to, you know, to help. Um, the mothership for executive functioning is ADHD. So I'm just gonna say as a model, they generally have a higher risk of dropout from college. But we know that you know, it's the most prevalent diagnose, uh, common diagnosis on campus. And grades are about, you know, always throughout the four years, about a half a grade lower than um, a student without executive functioning difficulties. And they're at higher risk of dropping out. But, oh, sorry, there's a typo. Um, but the predictors of success is incredibly important to know. What will happen if you have executive function issues is you have to focus on the things we talked about, the planning and time management and study skills. And another predictor of success is those who've received accommodations in high school and throughout the times that they're in college. That means that they have gotten help and, and practice with accepting help. Predictors of the poor performance is obviously not having these things and also having depression. And so we wanna make sure that we are um, you know, helping to support them so that they don't develop depression and, and poor self-esteem as a result of not being able to competently do these skills. Um, that's, that's the toll that this takes on people. So what we can be doing is help prepare them um, before they leave for college on how their diagnosis might affect their college studies. They'll need to know about the risk of symptoms relapsing and what signs to look for, uh, red flags that it might be coming back. Um, so if their anxiety is re-emerging or depression re-emerging or getting more obsessive, those are important to understand how that affects being able to do their, their classwork and how to plan in, in advance around all of that. And they, they need to be given the practical strategies like how do you establish care in the new place you're gonna be going in college? Um, they might not be able to continue with the same providers across state lines, and they might need to get a new psychiatrist, a new therapist. All of those things need to be thought through in advance so that they have all the supports in place. I would argue that you should insist that they register for, um, I call accessibility, but all different schools have different um, accommodations offices names for all four years that they, you know, most kids are not paying for school, right? <laughs> Most kids are not paying for their college tuition. I say that a big um, exchange for us to have is that, you know, they do their work in exchange for us helping to set up their tuition and their ability to go to college. So their job is to stay registered and accept the help and practice, you know, accepting help during high school as much as you can so that they accept this plan and get them to accept um, a plan with accommodations for college. And they might be simple things like signing up for a, a library study room um, in their first semester where there's always this quiet room that they can go to that um, they have set study times for. And all the different areas that we've been talking about 
the best thing that we can do is to help them learn to help themselves and hands-on learn how to do all of these skills themselves. And if we don't, the reason why we are focusing on this is because the number one reason people drop out of college is because the, this it's called overwhelm, a sense of overwhelm. They don't know how to juggle the multiple tasks and they don't know how to accept or seek help. So that's why we wanna do this. So these are the things that we've already mentioned um, that encourage executive function skills. You know, create your routines, um, let them see that um, they're learning coping skills and self-regulation skills during high school before they leave, using narration all the time, and then teaching them the importance of um, them knowing when and how to get help. And the last thing is just know that this has an end, that this is a period of time with our kids that learning these, these life skills um, have at the end of it, you know, the brass ring is that they're in a good place and set up for success in life. Um, and then just, you know, for you to know, all the rest of those slides are just about resources, but I'm gonna let you look at all those yourselves so that we can go right over the questions. Is that well, Eve? Thanks, Mary. Okay. That was great. Thank you so much. We've got a number of questions. I'm gonna start right off. What do you do with a kid with ADHD who has had a lot of supports all their life, but adamantly refuses to use the supports because of not wanting to appear like they need the help? So that's why I emphasize so much um, the importance of learning to accept help, because I see this all the time. Um, what do you do is not exactly um, the same necessarily for everyone. Trying to figure out why somebody is not um, accepting help, like the, the toll that it takes on their self-esteem to, to be looked at as someone is needing help. One practical thing that I like to do with people is to address it in a backdoor fashion. So they often feel like they're always the person who needs to be helped and they don't know how to do anything confidently and everybody you know thinks of them as less than. I like to give them opportunities to do something where they're a mentor for somebody else, where they're coaching little kids, where they're doing something that they're looked up to. And they start to see themselves as not just somebody who needs the help, but is also a provider of help. And the effect on their self-esteem, I see rise so significantly after that. So that's one practical thing. Is a young, if a young person takes a gap year, how do you suggest they spend it working on executive function skills? I think with an executive function coach is really helpful because um, a lot of these things, you know, are practical things you could do at home to set them up. Um, but it needs to be more explicit. You know, like any of our kids that have IEPs, we know the term explicit instruction, right? life skills, executive functioning needs to be explicit in instruction. And somebody who knows the curriculum, nobody, parents can't be experts in everything. And so an executive function coach or a therapist that, you know, advertises that they focus in the, on this is a good way to, to have that be taken care of. We have um, a video about coaching that when we send out in a couple of days, this video and Mary's um, PowerPoint will also send out the video about coaching, which will be very helpful. Thanks. Once you know that your kid has developed a skill of some kind, how and when should you place limits on consequences for not following through on that skill? Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think of what skill is it we're referring to. Uh, does anybody have the ability to write back what skill we're talking about? Um, so, cause I'm gonna just like arbitrarily pick something. So if we know that they know how to budget and they know that they have a certain amount of money to spend for the month um, and they have chosen to go over budget and, and then they're like, you know, in the last week of the month, they're like, um, I, I have no gas in my car. I think the consequence and the real answer is you have no gas in your car <laughs> and that's okay. And 
that's going to be the result of it, you know, because we don't want to buffer and we don't want to buffer people from consequences that are called natural consequences. If, if we were out in the world and something happened and we left, depleted our resources, that's what would happen. And so as long as it's a non-dangerous issue, I would let life happen and purposely let them learn. Um, a couple of people want to see some slides again. Um, one person is asking to see the planner and organizer slide again, if that's possible. And then this goes out later today, right? Yes. Okay. I could do that while I field the next question. Um. My daughter is very willing to watch recordings that I find valuable. What is the easiest way to find this, this recording? How will it be identified on the, oh, no, no, no. This is not, this is, um, this is, will be on the SpedNet website, um, www.spednetwilton.org. All of the presentations and the videos of all of the webinars live on our website. You can access them by speaker and by topic. And in the next couple of days, we will send out this presentation along with a couple of others that have to do with college and, and getting ready for college and coaching. Um, do students with autism have a lower chance of getting into college if they choose to disclose their disability? Well, that's sort of another topic all, altogether. Yeah. I feel like Eve, with your legal background, should be answering. Um, I think that um, we're actually gonna have that next year discussed because I don't I don't think the answer is that it that it changes their ability to get in. I think a lot of kids, I know a lot of kids talk about their autism or their ADHD or their learning differences and disabilities in their college essay. And we actually have a number of college essays on our website that are just amazing and that 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 talk about that. So I think it um, it depends how it's done. And if you want to write to us um, at info at spednetwilton.org, we can um, take it to, to some other folks who are attorneys and might have a different kind of answer. Um, sorry if you mentioned it and I missed it, but will everyone get a copy? Yes. Eve, I just wanted to mention to that person about autism also, there are um, college uh, programs that are the summer before entering college when you have a diagnosis um, like autism that I highly encourage people to um, participate in so that they um, have this kind of transition um, into college that's more supported by um, a professor and letting them uh, see what coursework is like and it's a very guided transition um, into seeing a college course. Um, what kind of training or certificates should an executive function coach have? You know, this is so terrible for me to have to say, but it's kind of a buyer beware situation, unfortunately, because we don't have a certification, like a license, for example. Um, I think that looking at the length of time somebody has been working in the field, when you look at a profile online and, um, and, and basically, do they have a background? You know, so usually it's somebody who's a therapist. Um, and, and they also are very willing to say, you know, past clients that, you know, they might be willing to say, like, you could talk to this mom about how it went for my kid, that kind of a thing. How do you keep, a, and, and um, the videotape recording that I'm going to send out about coaching, she talks a lot, of, the coach there talks a lot about that. It's a, it's a terrific um, webinar as well. How do you keep a kid from sliding back into their comfort zone of video games, phones, etc.? I think that's another very explicit thing to point out as well, that um, pointing out to them why they use it and when they're using it, pointing out that um, I wonder if something's going on, you know? So if you've had the conversation about how when stresses go up, your use of screens go up and having them learn that connection, you're then later able to say, hey, I noticed that this has been increasing lately. Is everything going okay? And then 
you know, have that conversation about supporting them because people don't do things for no reason. Um, and, and it serves a good purpose for them. And it just might be going over the line and taking away from time that they need to be doing something else. And so we don't want it to get too extensive, but, but it is a coping skill that they're using. And when they're needing to use it a lot, then something's going on. So I'd say to have the conversation. Are, are there any boot camps, college boot camps for executive functioning in the area? Um, I, I was hosting them through Insight Counseling in Ridgefield. I don't know that I've not looked to see if they still host um, them. Eve, do you know of any? I don't. Yeah, I don't. I don't know other than Insight. I haven't looked. But I will look into it and I will send, I will look into it and send something out. Okay. If I can find something. Okay. Um, regarding the current question, what about something like chores? I don't know if you mean about a boot camp with chores or maybe something about chores. Maybe um, they can add something. Whoever wrote that um, question can just add something about um, more specific okay. about what you mean. Uh -huh. uh, my child likes to turn on captions on movies. Are there apps to help transcribe lectures or videos? Yes, um, Dragon Naturally Speaking software is like the pioneer um, that invented transcription um, from text to speech. So I would look at Dragon um, and Speechify is the other one that I mentioned. That would be helpful. Is executive function coach services something that some insurances cover? I know that answer. <laughs> if, I, if it's a psychologist who is doing it or a social worker who, is, who takes insurance, it is, but many, many an, uh, executive function coaches are not either uh, a social worker or a psychologist. So it depends on if they're a medical professional. Is that the right answer? It is, absolutely. Um, if I may add, community college is a great way to practice executive function skills post high school without the added challenge of navigating dorm life. And at Connecticut this year, con community college has been free. That's a really um, good thing to add. Thank you very much. That's a great point and I 100% agree. If a young person with ADHD is taking stimulant medication, do we still need to expel 30% deficit in, in executive functioning or is the deficit mitigated? I'm so sorry to say it does not mitigate it at all. The research says it doesn't. And it doesn't mean don't take the medicine because it does nothing, but it's not going to make up the deficit, no. You know, it's that medication is, is dealing with something very different. It's dealing with the impulsivity and the focus and the hyper-focus, but, but executive function skills just need to be taught. Right, right. Uh, was from the... I was just sent information on a boot camp. Thank you. I'll forward it to you. And beyond Aquila? is a college prep program in New Hampshire that is good. Okay, so I will um, look into that and send that out when we send out um, Mary's. That's great. Mary's information, thank you very much. If a parent modeled poor self-regulation behavior like screaming, conflict, et cetera, how can the parent regain the child's trust? What a good question. That is such a nice, Question, and actually, I, I'm sorry, I took something out of the slides. I had a, um, a picture of this thing that said, I'm sorry. And I think that that is a huge thing to find opportunities to say to kids that we are human too, and that we apologize when something happens that we get dysregulated at times, and that we're not robots. And all of us do have times when we have these things happen. And it goes a really long way and is impactful when we can say the words, I'm sorry, because they're, we're modeling for them how to say sorry and acknowledge when something you know, gets out of hand. And 
it, it's it's the segue and the open door to regaining trust, I think, um, and kind of teaching humility at the same time. I think it's, I would invent reasons to like make sure I find opportunities to say, I'm sorry to my child, like just because of the benefits of it, honestly. So I would not worry and just use the opportunity. Do colleges allow gaming computers in dorms for freshmen? Yep. Yes, absolutely. Um, but again, have these conversations with them before about like why they're using it. Um, I've spent a lot of time talking to kids about gaming and I could spend, I could do an entire workshop on gaming and what the meaning is behind all of it. Some of the good things that they get from it. Um, you'd be shocked to know some of the incredible benefits that they get from gaming and when to recognize that it's over the line and into a clinical reason that they're using it and more of a mental health problem. Um, a mom is saying there are summer programs at some boarding schools oh. regarding executive functioning, um, such as at Foreman. Oh, that's great. Um, and the Foreman School, um, foremanschool.org backslash, backslash summer. Mm -hmm. um, I'll add that to the list as well. Um, my senior in high school has a hard time wanting to do anything on her own and gets angry at the thought that she's going to have to adult, i.e. get a job, etc. cetera. Yeah. Any suggestions? I would try to find out if what's going on is anxiety um, because um, being um, angry is really another expression of being nervous and worried. And thinking about the overwhelm that comes with having to problem solve and do things on your own is, is scary. And it sounds like she might just be expressing that without having all the words to explain it, that she's feeling really worried um, about having to do these things. And then, you know, maybe, you know, focused on coping, uh, focusing on coping skills, maybe even having therapy sessions to address um, whether there's worry and a need to explicitly train coping skills because the explicit training for coping skills does happen with therapy. Do kids with ADHD often have roommate difficulties? They're usually a lot of fun. Um, I would say they, they tend to have fun in college. Um, they have difficulty not being distracted by roommates. Um, that's, it, it's not usually that they have any more conflicts that I've ever heard from um, kids or anything, but they just have a hard time keeping themselves in line and on task because of having another person present. That's really, that's the only thing that I usually ever come up and see. Uh, Wilton High School has an executive functioning class that's not broadly publicized, another parent. Like so. you don't have to have a 504 and IEP to be part of it? I, I don't, I don't know. I know that um, when my son was at Wilton High School, there was a, a, a class that you did need to have to be receiving services for. I don't know how they do it now. Okay. Um, thank you, thank you, thank yous. Eagle Hill, oh, Eagle Hill in Massachusetts has a summer high school program too. Yeah, there, there are a number of boarding schools that end up having summer programs, either the summer prior to you starting yeah. is, is generally how it goes. Uh, um, as I said, I'll, I'll see what kind of research I can get done in the next day and, and send something out. That's great. Thank you for everybody for putting in the information. Yeah, that helps everybody else. That's great. Um, and I, I wanted to oh, one more. I, there's just one more. I'm sorry. I think this is the the question that is still not very clear. But something about if your um, child doesn't like to do chores and doesn't want to learn how to do chores, what kind of consequences, you know, can you have for mm -hmm. as opposed to I guess giving them the support? Okay. Um, I, I always come at things from the perspective of um, incentivizing with rewards um, rather than having a, um, a, a negative consequence. 
um, but a possibility for um, ever having consequences of anything, it should be what's called a natural consequence. So if you didn't do the dishes, you don't have clean dishes to use the next day. If you didn't um, do the laundry you had asked, been asked to do, you don't have clean socks the next day. Those are natural consequences of not doing chores um, that I can think of around the house. And so not um, eventually doing it for them is key so that they don't find that, well, if I say no or I walk away, I still have my clean clothes delivered to me. <laughs> that would be an, a very a natural thing to do and for us to not overly accommodate and say, all right, I'll just do it eventually because um, they're not gonna do it. Um, I, would, I would let it go and leave it and leave it um, and, until they had a natural consequence that they didn't um, get to um, have the clean item or, you know, I'm thinking of different chores around the house. Um, but in general, always first 100,000% do rewards. Um, how can you incentivize someone to want to do something for the pride of like learning to do something, to, you know, be an independent person, to get a step closer to earning um, a, a level of privilege in the house, like being able to use your phone is a privilege. We always forget um, being able to use uh, screen time, um, being able to do um, the things that we you know, let them do without um, them paying for is essentially that category. Um, we actually also just had a, um, a webinar about that. Um, Dave Silvestro did um, something that talks just about that same thing that Mary was was mentioning about encouraging responsibility and independence. It's on our website, um, the importance of positive communication at home, at school, and in the social arena, and it breaks down that even further with examples of language to use for your kids for different kind of positive um, reinforcing. Good. That's perfect. And, and I want to just point out again um, that the discussion about what we were um, talking about is much more important than um, some of the slides that just have like the, um, the icons for different apps and stuff that we cruised through. The presentation will be emailed to you so that you have them and you could just look them up on like the App Store or Google Play. Um, but the, you know, getting to the discussion of why these things are happening and what we can do about them is, is why we kind of went through some of those. But I did, while we were just talking about the answers, um, put up the slides that people were asking about with the different apps and stuff. All right. Um, somebody is something, something about raising their hand, but I can't pull up the question from a raised hand. I'm sorry. I just can't figure out how to do that. Oh. Um, any, do you see it? I actually don't. Oh, no. wait. Um, her name is Barbara. Yeah. But I don't see what the question is. <laughs> I don't know it. Um, last call for questions. We're going to say goodbye to Mary in a minute. So any other questions, please type them in now. Otherwise, thank you. Thank you so much, Mary. That was crazy helpful. And um, the, I see it with my son all the time when he went to college and the importance of all of the skills, all of the life skills he had and how important it was for him and how important it was for me to keep going at some of the things like budgeting as he went to graduate school, things that just don't go away. And if they're not taught them, they're just not gonna learn them on their own. And um, so I do see one more. How do you keep incentives from turning into bribes? Ah, interesting. Um, I don't know the distinction, um, but I have to say, I just want to normalize something for a second. We go to work because we get a paycheck, right? Like we do work for a result. We work for rewards. And so I don't think of it as manipulative that kids would be earning something for doing what's considered their work as a kid and being a good student is their job as a kid and being a contributing member to the house by doing chores is doing their job as a kid so giving them incentive um, rewards essentially is like us getting our paycheck and I, I do think that that's 
that's okay. And, and so I often would not consider it in the realm of pride. Um, and one more, what age do we start with these skills? Oh, yes. Oh my God. Very Seems important right away. <laughs> right away, like when they can walk, you know, like um, I think that kids are really, really happy when they have a purpose in life. When they think that, you know, all the adults around them are, you know, just, you know, they're a puppet and they're being told where to go, what to do, and they have no say, no role in anything. It's actually empowering for them to see that they do something that people appreciate and is needed to be done. And, and they're actually part of things. So when a very little kid, like I used to have my, my daughter when she was like four or five, she loved the laundry. And so she'd like pull it out and put it into the laundry basket. And she thought she was actually doing laundry. Like, it, you know, it was just age appropriate pulling laundry out of a bath and putting it into a basket, you know? Um, so literally whatever age you can think of um, that something seems appropriate, like starting to put the dishes away from the dishwasher it's a good concrete thing to start with. And that could be like seven, you know, really young. Actually, are there any specific IEP supports you recommend for improving executive functioning? We have an IEP, but it feels inadequate. So IEPs are so by nature because they're individualized education plans, they are so specific to a person um, there are, um, I have to be honest, software that the school systems use that generate the goals that go onto their IEPs. And so they're sometimes like copy paste, um, not individualized. And so you working with somebody personally who knows your child would be better than the kind of drop down menu that the system might have. So if it's not individualized enough, I would say, there's not a general recommendation I can make for it. And there's not a database somewhere for you to do, to grab it from. But um, a school counselor that knows them, a therapist that they've met, um, people like that in those professions know what kind of gaps are important to add to an IEP and can help you contribute. Because parents forget they're actually part of the PPT team and they can provide a suggested draft goal that is, you don't have to do it perfectly. Just say, hey, <laughs> my kid has problems with this part of executive functioning. Can you write a goal that addresses that? And that could be enough. And, and, but it's, it's, it could be done. Yeah, I think that um, that's exactly right. The more you know your kids, what mm -hmm. your kid is struggling with, the specifics that your kid is struggling with, for example, brings the homework in, puts it in the bottom of the backpack, never takes it out, doesn't hand it in. Those type of specifics can be dealt with like the resource room person or going in a little early and, and seeing the speech pathologist or someone who the child works with who can actually sit and go through their backpack and go, th and go through the things that they need. But whatever the specifics of that child's needs are mm -hmm. to find the right person who can address them. Um, is, is, can be very helpful. Uh, how can you implement restrictions and consequences if they didn't exist before? I get a lot of resistance and it will turn out to be a huge argument. I think that's the question about consequences that didn't come through before. How can you implement restrictions and consequences if they didn't exist before? You know, I think this kind of goes back to the question we had about how to apologize to our kids sometimes. I think an approach for this is to say, you know what? I sometimes make mistakes too. And I think that there has been something overlooked that I could be more helpful to you in helping you be better prepared for life. And so we're gonna start things over and we're gonna look at what things need to be done for you to be independent one day and and get that brass ring of like being able to like go and, and, and live on your own someday. And that starts with me helping you learn how to do some different things. And so you're going to have a new system in the house now. And it starts with these kinds of rewards to kind of keep it going. And I would not at all 
if this is operator dependent, if you try to do it yourself without any guidance, it doesn't end well, I'll just say. <laughs> so working with um, like an executive function coach or a therapist could help craft that and even help you through the discussion of starting the process and then kind of putting with the, the, the structure of the executive functioning skills and rewards and, and um, I hate using the word consequences, but what that would be, um, what it would look like in the house because it's not easy to do and you need guidance to do it. Um, a mom is saying, I have a kid who's going to be reaching the age to drive, looking for a driving school that helps kids that have ADHD, shorter instruction periods, etc. They exist. So I'm not sure if she's saying that she found one or if she's looking for one, but I will tell everyone that um, next year we're having somebody come and talk about driving for kids on the spectrum and kids with ADHD because it, it driving impacts every single executive function skill. And it's such an amazingly hard thing that people, kids just think, oh, it's, a, and parents, that it's a rite of passage. And now all the other kids are doing it and it's not a problem and it's not gonna be a problem for my kid. But when your kid has executive function skills, it is a terribly difficult thing to do. Um, I don't know about special driving schools. I know the one, um, you can always have extra time and just have more time in the car. I want you to think about the 30% rule too and think about whether 16 is the appropriate time to start driving. I often say no, um, like pretty much standard, I say no. Um, they're driving a weapon and, and they might be more cognitively like a 13 year old in terms of their impulse control and ability to drown out distractions and they're still quite inattentive or impulsive if they have that diagnosis. So I think that that's individual decision, but it's not usually the traditional age of 16. Um, so. um, uh, mom says, my son is doing driving lessons with Ron at the next street. He works with lots of kids with disabilities. So thank you for that. Ron at the next street. I will say that I have a kid with ADHD who lives in New York City and is not driving. He's 29 and he will probably not drive for a long time. And he realizes that he just, not that this is for everyone, but being in the city, you don't need to. And some kids just can wait much longer. Because my son is aware of his differences, he hasn't left home for summer sleepaway camp or any trip away from home. Are there any summer programs that will allow him to practice this? Practice being away from home before yeah. they go to college is important. I get that. Um, so there are a list of summer camps that comes out every year. And I think it's through Attitude Magazine. Yeah, I sent it out today. I, I posted it on our um, Facebook page. Oh, perfect. And, and I'll actually send, I'll add the link to that. Yep, that's the perfect way to do it. It's a good way to practice. Okay. Um, My 18 year old daughter impulsively changes lanes on the highway. She got into an accident two weeks after getting her license. Luckily she was terrified after the accident and nobody got hurt, natural consequences. But seriously, the driving thing is, um, is, is huge. Yeah. I, oh, and one last thing, um, a mom is saying we hired an advocate and that was key to getting um, the help we needed executive function wise. And that's, you know, yes, that's always an, always an option, but there's nothing that takes the place of you knowing your child and knowing what, what your child needs and, and for your child to understand go before he or she goes off to college, what, what they need and to be able to explain it to others. Exactly, yeah. By the way, about driving, I just wanna say that sometimes people um, only take their ADD meds for school and they don't take it on the weekends and they don't recognize that it is um, critical to them being able to pay attention. And so if they're doing anything that could be dangerous, like driving a car, they should be taking their medicine that day. And sometimes they just think school, that's the only day I take my medicine. And they, they put that in a discrete category and we have to remember it's not just for school, it's for being able to pay attention and safety is 
really the most important thing. Thank you, Mary. Thank you so, so much. I don't see any more questions and we've gone way over. So we really appreciate it. We love your presentations. And um, so just so everyone knows, yes, you will get a copy of Mary's presentation as well as um, this video within the next couple of days and with a list of some of the things that I said that I would check out for you. Mary's information here. Um, if people want to get in touch with, you know, with you with further questions or whatever, I know that you're always happy to, um, to receive them. Okay. Oh, wait a minute. No, oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Yeah. That's it. Thanks, everybody. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mary.